Okay, so welcome everyone um, to this fourth session of um, IAPS at a distance. Uh, today, our topic is going to be geodesy. And um, for to present the, the topic, uh, we have here today Dr. Annette Eicher uh, and Dr. Marco Botanen um, from the International Association of Geodesy. Uh, and I will now present you um, with a short biography of each of them. Um, so Professor PhD Marco Potanen is the Secretary General of the International Association of Geodesy uh, since 2019. He has been Director of the Department of Geodesy and Geodynamics um, of the Finnish Geospatial Research Institute um in the national land survey of finland uh, from 2001 to 2019 he has been working in the fgi since 1985 on satellite geodesy and positioning reference frames and metrology he has an associate professorship in two universities um he's the, also the chairman of the nordic geodetic commission and has been president of eurf iax commission on the of the europe uh, reference frames. He was chairing the United Nations Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management in Europe, a uh, working group of geodetic reference frame uh, in Europe, and he is a member of the United Nations Subcommittee on Geodesy. Um, he has also been president of the European Geosciences Union Geodesy Division, president of the International Association of Geodesy, uh, Subcommission 3.2 Crystal Deformations and is a member of several national committees related to the International Science Council, uh, having been chairing the National Committee of the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics and National Committee on Arctic and Antarctic Research. Uh, Potanen has more than 250 scientific and popular articles and he is author, co-author, and editor of university-level textbooks and popular books on astronomy and geodesy. Asteroid 3760, uh, Potanen is named after him. He is a full member of the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters and a corresponding member of the German Geodetic Commission. Welcome, Dr. Potanen. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Annette Eicher. Uh, between 1997 and 2002, uh, Dr. Eicher attended the study program surveying at the University of Bonn in Germany. She was a PhD student at the Institute of Geodesy and Geoinformation, also at uh, Bonn University from 2002 until 2008, when she started a postdoc lasting until 2016. During that time, uh, Dr. Eicher did two research studies, one at the University of Köln. Um, from May to July of 2014, and one at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, USA, from March to September of 2015. Since 2016, uh, she has been professor for geodesy and adjustment theory at the Hafen City University, Hamburg. And now I will give the word um, to Dr. Eicher and uh, Dr. Potanen to. Um, give a presentation on today's topic and on the International Association of Geodesy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So maybe I can start. Uh, we have been planning uh, the, our presentation so that I will give a short uh, introduction what is geodesy and also an introduction what is the International Association of Geodesy. Uh, and uh, then Annette will give a little bit more specific uh, topic related on the climate change and how geodesy can help in that, because I, I think we are in very good uh, position to, to study that and uh, geodetic uh, data is one of the most important thing to understand the phenomena. So this is the roughly what we are going to give in this something like 20 minutes presentation each. So I try to share my screen to get the, get the presentation here. Let's see. Okay, if you can 
someone yes. confirmed that uh, it's, it's visible. Very good. Okay, so what is geodesy? Uh, but before we go into that, I, I have uh, something to think about. Uh, when you are buying the milk, can of milk from the shop. Yeah, that's fine. You can use it many places. And uh, where do you need uh, farmers or where do you need cows? Because you get the milk uh, from the shop. Equally, when you are going to navigation, uh, you can get the coordinates or your position on the map directly uh, from your GPS receivers. It, it seems that my sound is uh, circulating somewhere with a very, very big delay. Okay, but uh, this is something, something to think about that uh, there must be something behind the milk. There must be something behind the coordinates or navigation from the GPS receiver. So you can think what happens if uh, there are no cows or if there are no farmers to feed the cows or milking the cows. Uh, equally, it's also similar that uh, there must be something behind this GPS uh, positioning or coordinates. There must be some geodetic reference frames, networks, observations, and uh, especially geodesists to take care of these. So this is, uh, this is the good to remember that uh, it's, uh, it's not coming like that. You need a lot of work for that. And therefore, it's, it's good to remember that uh, we are living on a restless planet, meaning that uh, nothing is permanent here. Uh, we cannot find the fixed point on the Earth. Everything is moving. Earth is moving in space, crust is moving. There is also a lot of phenomena happening inside the Earth. And uh, all these are affecting uh, what we can observe, what we can measure here on the Earth. And uh, to get our position here, for instance, uh, needs a lot of other things to understand, a lot of other things to measure, to get these coordinates, to get this position. And uh, not only to measure, but somehow we have also to understand why it's happening, how it's happening. It's maybe the other disciplines uh, who are actually making that interpretation of what is happening. But still, all everything is, is affecting on our measurements. Uh, at the right hand side, you can see some examples of uh, what has happened after big tsunamis, uh, what happens if, if you are measuring the glaciers. You can go even the bottom, you can go to the Antarctica to make the measurements there. And it's very interesting that uh, whatever you are doing, you may expect uh, sometimes effect on the opposite side of the Earth. A good example is uh, melting the, the ice sheets uh, of Antarctica. I think Annette will uh, speak a lot more about this, but just mentioning that uh, it's uh, affecting the sea level rise. And uh, you can see it at our coastlines, what happens uh, down there. So that, that way it, it's good to remember that uh, there are a lot of things uh, on the earth and we have to understand the Earth as a whole. In addition to the local measurements, we have to understand the Earth as a whole to get all this information. Uh, the three pillars of geodesy, what we are actually doing, this is a very old idea, more than 150 years, that there are three different uh, categories. We can say shape of the Earth. If you look the definition of geodesy in the, in the textbooks or, or Dictionaries, it says that it's something related to the size and shape of the Earth, but it's just uh, one leg of this. So this uh, answers that where we are, how the crust is deforming, and so on, this kind of uh, things. But then we need also the Earth orientation and rotation in space, because it is directly related to time. It's directly related, for instance, to the satellite positioning, which we need uh, on the uh, navigation, for instance, or studying the sea level or whatever 
on the Earth or, or what, whatever there are the satellites. And the third leg on, on, this, on these pillars, on the third pillar, uh, is the gravity and gravity field, where the water is flowing, uh, how the mass changes are happening on the Earth. It's a very huge effect, actually, in the long time scale, when you think uh, that uh, uh, glaciers are growing and, and waning and melting. Uh, there are post-glacial rebound. There are all different kind of uh, mass transportation. Gravity measurement is one key to, to understand this phenomena. But also the gravity field is needed to understand how the satellites are orbiting the Earth. So this is the, the whole thing what we think we can use, we need to measure, we need to understand. And uh, there are a lot of uh, different kind of uh, geodetic measurements or geodetic techniques, which we roughly can divide into categories. Uh, terrestrial measurements, which are the traditional ones, uh, which have been done for centuries already, measuring the angles, distances, with different kind of uh, instruments, leveling, meaning that uh, measuring the height and height differences, and measuring the gravity with different kind of uh, gravimeters. So these are giving you the very detailed, very precise information locally. But to understand the Earth as the whole, you need something uh, which happened, uh, started uh, more than 60 years ago, 60 years ago uh, with the first satellites, which we can call the space geodetic techniques. There are this uh, GNSS navigation, including uh, GPS, Clonas, Galileo, Beidou, which is most familiar to many of you. Just uh, this uh, navigation possibilities are now in, in mobile phones. You have uh, different kind of uh, instruments to measure your position on the Earth. With the accuracy 60 years ago, you cannot even imagine what, what it was. But in addition to this uh, GPS and other navigation instruments, you have also a lot of other geodetic techniques which are vital. Without these, you cannot use, for instance, GPS. One is satellite laser ranging. I have one slide a little bit later on that. Uh, geodetic VLBI, very long baseline interferometry with uh, big radio telescopes. You are observing uh, actually the very distant uh, uh, objects, quasars, which are a kind of uh, fixed point on the sky. And you can, for instance, measure the orientation of the Earth in space using this technique, which is actually needed for, for navigation as well. Uh, you can use the gravity satellites to get uh, information on the gravity and gravity changes on, on the global level. Satellite altimetry to measure the sea level, changes or, or even glacier changes, uh, synthetic aperture radar, which is a kind of uh, radar measurements uh, also on the surface of the Earth uh, from the satellites. And uh, then there are other techniques like DORIS for measuring the satellite orbits and so on. So there are a lot of different kind of uh, techniques. I am not going to into detail on, on these, but just uh, showing that uh, uh, it's not only GPS. It's a huge number of different kind of techniques, different kind of measurements, and all these are needed to understand the Earth and what is happening. Uh, a good example is that we need a reference frame. The reference frame uh, is needed to fix, to give your place, your position on the Earth. But there are two different kinds of uh, reference frames. What we are using normally in our maps, in our navigation, is something which we can call that it is Earth-centered or Earth-fixed. And uh, it's very that way very useful because uh, when we are uh, in one place on the Earth, our coordinates will not change. But it is not that way very useful when we are describing the uh, motion of the satellite on the sky. Because as you see, the Earth is rotating, and uh, with this rotation, uh, the orbit or the movement of the satellite in the sky looks very strange. But if you look it from outside, you can see that uh, 
the orbit of the satellite is much more simple. It's uh, orbiting the Earth, the Earth is rotating inside. And now if you have uh, information on the orientation of the Earth at every moment, then you can get the link between the satellite and your position. And this is needed and this is the only way to use the navigation satellites, what you are doing. And for that, you will need also this information. And geodetic observations are giving this information about the orientation of the Earth in space. Uh, yeah, as I said, that satellite positioning is one of these uh, most well-known uh, application, geodetic applications today. And it was a big change when GPS was coming in uh, late 1980s. Uh, this is a good example of uh, what, what has happened on first, first on the most precise measurements. This is one of the basic uh, triangulation point in Finland. Uh, and the original triangulation measurements started in 1920s, ended 1980s. It took almost 70 years to complete the, the network. Now the same network was measured with GPS a few years later. Uh, during one summer, or actually two, two summers. Uh, so it, it means that the GPS was uh, much, much faster, more accurate and weather independent. And this was just, uh, this is just the most precise measurement. And you need this to create the national network uh, for the national reference frame or the global reference frame, frame whatever you want. And with uh, when you have a reference frame measured with this kind of high accuracy measurements, then you can use your navigation instruments to get you on the map, which is fixed on this reference frame. Yeah, by the way, about this uh, place, this is a very special place. The reason why I took it here, because uh, I think none of you uh, have been here. I have not been there, but every Finn knows this place. Uh, you may guess what it is because of the guy at the lower left, uh, Santa Claus. And uh, we all Finns know that uh, this place is the home of Santa Claus. He is not from the North Pole or Sweden or wherever. He is from this mountain from Finland. So now you have seen it. Uh, but in addition to this uh, single uh, sites, you will need also something which we can call the fundamental stations or, or core stations globally. And then there are maybe a dozen or a couple of dozens of uh, places where you have uh, all or most of these uh, space geodetic instruments at the same site. Uh, here is the example of our Finnish site uh, called Metsähovi Observatory or Metsähovi Geodetic Research Station. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, of almost all of these instruments what I was describing before there are we are now renewing that for the new uh, radio telescope satellite laser ranging has been there since 1978 uh, there are several gps gns receivers gravity laboratory test field for uh, for instance testing the uh, gps gns antennas and so on so these are the fundamental stations globally which are fixing the uh, global reference frame. And these are something the, the International Association of Geodesy, IAG, is coordinating how these observations are done, how they are collected, how they are analyzed, delivering the data and so on. And uh, just a couple of words about some of these instruments. VLBI, very long baseline interferometry, interferometry it's based on these very distant objects, as I said, quasars, and uh, there must be two or three or more uh, radio telescopes observing at the same time, the same quasar. And enough observations, then you can get, uh, for instance, the orientation of the Earth relative to these uh, points or, or quasars, fixed points on the sky. And this is the only way to get uh, the uh, orientation of the Earth in space. And uh, this is needed, uh, as I, I said before, to get, uh, for instance, the, the navigation satellites, the results of, from that. Uh, and this is the only technique which is uh, not dependent on satellites. 
So that, that's why we need a network of these radio telescopes. There are something like 30, 40 uh, telescopes at the moment uh, globally to do this work. And the similar number of uh, other instruments, satellite laser ranging, which is a kind of uh, lasers, laser distance meter, measuring the distance to the specific satellites. And uh, this is especially important to getting uh, the origin of our reference frame uh, placed on the mass center of the Earth. But also uh, the satellite laser ranging measurements are important for uh, getting the orbits or the calibrating the orbits of some satellites. So both ways it is, it is needed. So these are examples of these big instruments which are not that common, but which, which are very important to get these things. So it, it means that uh, uh, we, we can say that we have two different uh, categories now again. Uh, one is this uh, geometric VLBI satellite laser racing GNSS, where we can get our position on the Earth, which we can use for navigation, mapping, and so on. But immediately when we are starting to speak about uh, uh, brustal deformation, tectonics, sea level changes, uh, melting of uh, glaciers or ice sheets, and so on, height systems, uh, immediately we are speaking about the gravity. And uh, the gravity is that way different that uh, you need different techniques to measure. You need gravi gravimeters to measure the changes or the value of the gravity. And uh, both are needed to understand the Earth. On gravity, as I said, there are these uh, Earth fixed uh, instruments, gravimeters. There are absolute gravimeter, which we are measuring the acceleration of the body falling in, in the vacuum, or we can have uh, the spring gravimeters or relative gravimeters to measuring the uh, differences of gravity from one place to another, or we can use the superconducting gravimeter where we are measuring the changes of the small test mass floating in, in the stable magnetic field created by the superconducting coil. Or then we can use the uh, gravity satellites to measure the regional or global value of the gravity or gravity changes. And this is very important for, for instance, to, uh, when we are studying the changes on the uh, glaciers or, or melting, the, melting the glaciers and, and chasing, increasing the amount of the seawater. And uh, the other one technique, uh, which is quite often categorized as uh, remote sensing is the measuring with the radar, you can measure the height of the sea surface, changes in that during years or decades, changing in, in uh, gravity and so on, uh, sorry, in, in, in glaciers and so on. So there are several of these uh, Earth exploring satellites. And uh, the link to the previous instruments, for instance, is that all these have the prisms for the satellite laser ranging. So for, for instance, with satellite laser ranging, you can measure the very precise uh, height of this instrument, a kind of that way to calibrate uh, the height of the instruments which you are needed to get the precise measurement with the radar. So there are a lot of uh, different kinds of tectonic motions, uh, deformation on the Earth. You can, with the GPS or, or CNS network, you can measure the uh, motion of the continents, uh, some centimeters per year maximum. You can, you can imagine that, that the speed, how, how fast your continent is moving, just uh, watching your fingers. Your fingernails are growing about the same speed as uh, what the continent is moving, a couple of centimeters, three centimeters per year. But if you wait 500 million years, you can get around the globe. So it's just a question of time, but uh, this is about the speed we can, we can measure with uh, the GPS. Or at the lower right, you can see that in, in Northern Europe, in Fennoscandian area, you have the post-glacial rebound, which is about the maximum is uh, almost one centimeter per year. Uh, this has been known for a long time, but uh, with the GPS, you can measure it very 
very precisely, very accurately. And uh, at the lower left, you can see an example from Antarctica with these color codes, uh, how much the glacier uh, or the actually the uh, Antarctic ice sheet is changed during years and uh, re during recent years. Most of this can be measured with the, either the, by the gravity satellites or the altimeter satellites. And there you can get the imagination how much, for instance, the, the glacier has been changed uh, from that area, which is otherwise very, very difficult to measure. Or you, you can measure also different, uh, a lot of different uh, kind of things elsewhere. Like this is the example of this uh, almost 10 years ago, this catastrophe in uh, Japan, uh, this Tohoku Oki earthquake, which is a huge tsunami, which uh, was destroying that, uh, that uh, nuclear power station there. Uh, at the right hand side bottom, you can see the red arrows which is almost a real-time measurement with the Japanese cheap permanent genes network. Uh, the motion uh, during and immediately after the earthquake, when uh, it was almost four meters jump back in the, in, in the direction of the ocean when the earthquake happened. So it, it was a huge uh, change, which was almost in real time visible from the from the, the measurement of this uh, big uh, GNS, GNSS network in Japan. Uh, also the same what was uh, seen in, in height, but much less, uh, less than about one meter in mostly. But also you were able to see the, the shock wave going across the island. So all these can be visible in the, uh, this is just an example what you can see in, in modern uh, geodetic measurements. So that was the short presentation about uh, what's geodesy. But uh, also I, I have a couple of slides here about uh, uh, what is the International Association of Geodesy, IAG. And uh, the roots are almost uh, about 150 years uh, in past, uh, 18, in mid uh, 1860s, uh, it was established the first uh, organization in, in Germany. And uh, IHC is one of the oldest uh, international association. And uh, about 100 years ago, there came more. And uh, uh, nowadays, IHC is a part of the International Union of uh, Geodesy and Geophysics. So there are a lot of other, other associations under this uh, International Science Council. Uh, like Astrono Union of Astronomy or Physics and so on. And this uh, IUGG is one of these. And below IUGG, we have this International Association of Geodesy. We have the General Assembly every four years. Last time it was uh, uh, last year in Montreal. Next one should be in uh, three years from now in Berlin. Uh, and uh, two years after the General Assembly, there's the Scientific Assembly. Next year, we are expecting that to have in Beijing. Let's see what happens. Or should it be remotely? Who knows yet? And then there are annually, there are several uh, topic, topical meetings, symposia. And on, on this uh, slide, you can see the organizational structure of IHC. By the way, you can, if you uh, go to the web page you can you can find this uh, IHC, IH, uh, IHC AIG org you can you can see the all the, every every information on, on that web page but there are several commissions uh, and then there are especially these IHC services which are taking care of this uh, organization of the geodetic observations. It's good to remember that uh, all these observations, they are made by the universities, uh, research institutes, and such uh, on the best effort basis. And uh, as well, these IHC services are also hosted by some of these organizations. And uh, this is something which uh, we have to remember that uh, uh, 
the nations themselves are not committed to, to maintain these reference frames, not maintain the uh, uh, systems, not maintain the observations, but uh, they are the institutes, they are the universities who are doing that. And this is one of the big discussion today. We are trying to organize these things under the United Nations to get these commitments a little bit better than what, what it is uh, today. Uh, I'm not going to detail about these services, but uh, it's, it's good to, to know that there are a lot of these, for instance, for the uh, GPS, GNS observations is the IGS uh, for the satellite laser ranging is uh, I, uh, uh, ILRS, uh, BLBI, IVS, and so on. And then there is this uh, global geodetic observing system, GIGOS, which is uh, coordinating or, or being a light of like of uh, umbrella for these uh, IHC uh, Earth observations, and it's good to remember that uh, these uh, IHC services they are enabling many many things, like getting your position, your coordinates uh, uh, on the Earth, uh, regional reference uh, system, reference frames like uh, European. Uh, reference system, what uh, European people are using in the maps, uh, traffic, crustal deformation, farming, uh, everything what you can th think about uh, the positioning or, or navigation. When you are go deep enough, you can see that uh, it is, uh, it is uh, geodetic observations, it is some organization uh, who enables that. Okay, that was more or less the uh, short introduction, and uh, I, I think it's maybe good to to tell because uh, I have been speaking uh, a little bit uh, similar introduction to the student uh, physics students in, in Helsinki University, and uh, sometimes I have got a, a comment that oh, this is very interesting, and this is the first time I heard the word geodesy. So unfortunately, it seems that geodesy is not that very well uh, known. And how, how you end up to geodesy? And this is my story that I, I started in astronomy and physics, actually. And uh, it, it was more or less uh, by chance that I ended up to the Finnish Geodetic Institute 1985. And the most important reason was that it, it was the permanent post. And uh, as a graduate student, you are very glad if you, if you know that, okay, now you, you will have the salary. And since that, I have been there. And actually, geodesy is not that far from physics or astronomy. There are a lot of uh, common things in that. It's the, both are that way the natural sciences. And uh, then it, it means that whatever you are studying in physics, astronomy, or, or any natural sciences, mathematics, you probably can use that also in, in geodesy. Okay, so I think that was, that was my, my contribution and I stop sharing my screen and uh, give the talk to Annette. Okay, thank you, Marco. And uh, for this introduction, and I now have the pleasure to present a bit more specific on my own research. Um, and let me also share my screen. I hope you can now see the PowerPoint slides. Yes. Nice. And let's start the presentation. Well, I will come back to something that Marco has already pointed out that part of geodetic observations is observing gravity. Um, and we, I use this personally to study climate change. Before I come back to this, let me also answer the question. Duarte um, asked us to, to say a few words on this. How did I become a geodesist? And different from Marco, I was really a geodesist from the start. And for me, it's actually hereditary. Because if you take a look at my family tree, this is me. And everybody who is here in red circle is a geodesist. 
So not only my dad was a geodesist, but also my brother, my uncle, their son, and his wife. So when you look at my genes, I guess I didn't really have a different choice than becoming a geodesist. However, while the rest of my family is more going into the direction of very classical surveyors, surveying, at least in Germany, is part of geodesy. I personally, for myself, I chose a different path, more towards science. And we have already heard in the introduction by Duarte, so I can skip this more or less, that I'm now a professor for geodesy and adjustment theory. The rest of my scientific life, I spent mostly at the University of Bonn with two very interesting research days in foreign places in France and um, in California at NASA's JPL who also work a lot with geodetic data. But let me come to my topic today. We are, as you all know, living in a changing world. We have sea level rise, glacier melting, increased flooding, droughts, and so on. And if you take, really think about it, all of these phenomena that are, that are very closely related to climate change are also very closely related to redistributing water. We have either too much water or not enough water, like here or here. So water is changing place when the climate changes. And this happens both above the ground at the surface, but also below the ground. If you take, for example, these increasing drought events, they happen mostly below the ground. Because when we have a drought, also the groundwater changes. Now, if you want to observe changes in groundwater, of course, you can dig a well and take a look. But if you want to do this on a global scale, because climate change is a global phenomenon, then we would prefer to measure it with satellites. However, due to very obvious reasons, groundwater is invisible to classical remote sensing that you might know taking pictures from a satellite, because it's happening underground. However, as physicists, I don't have to tell you that water is quite heavy and that every, every heavy object causes gravity. So when we change the mass of our groundwater, then we change gravity at this point on the Earth. And if we change gravity, for example, here we have an increase in groundwater, then this also changes the orbit of the satellite because we pull stronger at our satellite due to more mass. So the satellite orbit changes. Or to reverse, if the groundwater is drying, then the satellite orbit changes in the opposite direction. And this is actually what we measure. We use not one satellite, but two satellites for this. And together they are the satellite mission GRACE. And it has also become the name, uh, gotten the name race is like a scale in the sky. We can weigh water on Earth from the sky. And this is our measurement. And this we use to observe on a global scale gravity. And here you can see how this works. Here we have the gray satellites. There are two satellites following each other on the same orbit. And well, first of all, they have GPS receivers on board. So they observe their own position by gravity. From this, you can already get these orbit differences I just showed you. However, there's more. Of course, there's also a microwave connection, a link between the two satellites. And we very, very accurately determine the distance changes between the two satellites. So now at the first satellite, as you can see very soon, is approaching a heavy object like this iceberg here, or a mountain, or water, then it gets attracted a bit earlier than the second satellite. And the second satellite follows a little later. And these changes in the distance, this is our prime observation type. If you take a look, this distance is 250 kilometers between the satellites and our microwave instrument as a measurement accuracy of a few micrometers. If you express 250 kilometers in micrometers, that's a lot of micrometers. And what we are measuring is actually the last digit. So that's a relative measurement accuracy of 10 to the power of minus 12. 
to give you an idea, your average human hair has a thickness of about 50 micrometers. So we are measuring a fraction of a human hair on 250 kilometers distance. So it's just crazy, even for me. And I've been working with these guys with these data all my scientific life. Um, GRACE was a mission, joint mission um, by NASA and the German DLR. Um, it has died, unfortunately, 2017, but the follow-up mission, GRACE follow-on, has been in orbit since 2018 to continue the measurements. Those two race each other through space. That's why um, some people gave them the name Tom and Jerry regarding the cartoon characters. So the result of this is gravity on a global scale. And at least myself, I remember I learned in school at some point that the gravity acceleration at the Earth's surface is 9.81 meters per second square. Then a little later in school, I also learned, well, the Earth is flat a bit, flattened a bit. So we have different gravity at the equator and at the pole. And we are now interested in the derivations of this, the differences to this ellipsoidal shape. And this we call gravity anomalies. And if you take a look at gravity anomalies on the global scale, you can see here a lot of geology in there. You can see mountain ranges, the Himalaya, you can see deep sea trenches here. And so the geology is mapped into the gravity acceleration. However, if we are talking about climate change, we are of course more interested in how gravity changes over time. So let's see, this is March, 2008. And this is the gravity field in September, 2008. March, September. Can anybody see any difference? March, September. Well, let me compute the difference for you. So I subtract both and the result is zero. So no, you cannot see any difference. But we can take a look here at the scale and we can change the scale. If we now change the scale from 100 to one, we can see something, but that's not really helpful because what we see is just noise. The observation noise in our satellite data completely masks any signal we could analyze. So what can we do? We can try to smooth it, to filter it. So let's run a filter over our stripy pattern. The result is, again, zero, because the signal is so much smaller than the noise. So we can go again, adjust the scale down here. And then if we go another factor of 100 smaller, then our signal starts to appear. And this is like the challenge of our everyday life, of my life, for example, that extracting such tiny signal from noisy satellite data is super challenging. That's why there are so many people getting the PhD on analyzing these kind of data. However, we can do it. And the result is a map of gravity more or less every month for the last, since 2002. There are some data gaps due to instrument failures, but we basically have a pretty good picture of what gravity has been doing. We put these monthly models into a movie, then we get the changes in gravity. And changes in gravity, what you see here, can very much be related to changes in water mass. So you see water floating around, blue means there's a lot of water, Red means there's a lack of water. So water is coming and going and floating around on the surface of the earth. And if you take a closer look at these signals, then you first of all have a very strong annual cycle in there. That makes sense. For example, here in the Amazon river basin, where it's a lot of rain during the rainy season, you can take a look at the time series and you see that whenever there's rainy season in the first months of each year, Amazon gets heavy. There's a lot of water pouring down in the Amazon and the region gets heavy from so much water. So we have these really up and down and up and down 
in our grace gravity data, reflecting the rain and dry seasons in the Amazon basin. We talk about climate change, we're even more interested in the long term trends. So this is the linear trend measured from grace. And now each of these red and blue blobs on this map, there have been a paper or many papers on this. So I could more or less tell you a story on almost all of these blobs. So if you like, pick your favorite and after the presentation, you can ask about it. I would only like to point out a few of these. Let's start with some negative signals. Negative meaning the mass is lost here. Grace sees a negative mass trend here. What's happening there? Why is mass lost in these regions? This brings me back to the beginning of my presentation. These are actually regions, all of them, where very heavy agriculture comes together with not enough water. So the irrigation is done from groundwater abstractions. There's a very famous example in northern India, which was actually the first um, time this was published. And this was really a sensational finding that we can actually observe groundwater changes from space. The other examples I wanted to show you are maybe the most prominent trend signals in our GRACE data. Um, I guess you might even already have an idea what we see here. This is also a mass loss. And this mass loss is caused by the melting of glaciers and ice sheets, which we have in Greenland, in Alaska, and in Antarctica. I will only show you the example of Greenland. This is the GRACE mass trend from Greenland. You see it's almost always everywhere it's zero, it's negative so there's mass loss but the mass loss is particularly prominent in the big outlet glaciers where the water flows towards the sea and these outlet glaciers are melting the most strongly and if you take the time series all the mass melting in greenland together for each month you see a time series looking like this first of all there's a very prominent negative trend. But of course, there are also some seasonal variations because in the winter, there's snow. Greenland becomes heavier. In the summer, Greenland, the ice is melting. We are losing mass. So people have estimated from GRACE data that 280 gigaton mass are lost per year. Now is my question again, who can really imagine a gigaton? Personally, myself, I have some problems with this. So the question is, is this a lot? Is this troublesome or should we care about it? So let's see. A gigaton is more or less one kilometer times one kilometer times one kilometer of water. So that already sounds like a lot. To even get a better grasp on it, we have done our own little ice experiment. This is an ice cube, it's about 60 liters um, big. I would like to point out this tropical island, which over the course of this exhibition day drowned in sea level rise. But this was taken in the morning where the island was still okay. And we computed that of these ice blocks, 150,000 are melting in Greenland every single second. So while I've been talking about Greenland, I don't know, like two millions of these ice blocks have just melted into the sea while we were talking. And this is just incredible. I mean, it's so scary, I think. Um, so I would say, yes, this is a number we should definitely worry about. So the last question for my presentation, what happens now with this, all this melted ice? How does it flow into the ocean? And well, it was kind of surprising for me at first that the global ocean is not acting like a bathtub. So it's not like you fill it 
and it just rise, ri rises uniformly. On the contrary, the global ocean is much more complicated. So what happens if the ice melts in Greenland? Let's see, this is the original situation. We have the ice here. The ice attracts the water. So the water is kind of a little inclined towards the ice because the ice is heavy attracting the water. So ice causes gravity itself. And here we see the water attracted by the ice. Now the ice melts. Goodbye ice. Then, of course, we have more water on the ocean. That's without question. So on the global average, sea level is rising. However, we also have lost the gravitational effect of our ice here. So while there is more water in the ocean, it's not attracted towards the Greenland coast anymore. So at the Greenland coast, sea level is actually sinking due to melting ice sheets in Greenland. And that was something which was completely incredible when I first learned about it. I could, just couldn't believe it. But you can actually compute this and it's apparently true. Then we have some more issues. The land area is rebounding because the loading of the ice mass is not there anymore. And the ocean floor is deforming because we now have additional loading on the ocean floor. And all this happens simultaneously. That's why studying sea level is not exactly an easy topic. Uh, this is an animation a former colleague of mine um, made, and I think it pretty much shows all the interplay between the land, and the, the ice, and, and the ocean, making sea level studies so challenging. Nevertheless, we can compute the effect of melting in Greenland. And there you can see that around Greenland, the sea level is dropping. And if you get farther away from Greenland, sea level is rising. We call this the fingerprint of the ice melting in Greenland. I have one more complication for you. Of course, additionally, in a warming climate, the temperature rises. So we additionally have a volume change. And this volume change, Grace cannot see at all. Because Grace only measures gravity change and is completely blind to volume change. That's why, and uh, Marco has already explained this, we need a different geodetic observing technique. It's called satellite altimetry. And these are satellites using radar to measure the distance to the ocean, and this way getting the geometrical changes in sea level. And these geometrical changes in sea level are maps which see pretty often. And from this also comes this conclusion, which you can all see in the IPCC climate reports, that sea level on average is rising by three millimeters per year. And however, this map already shows you that this um, sea level rise is not uniform. There are some regions in the globe, for example, here or here, where the rise is a lot more than the three millimeters per year. And there are other regions where sea level is actually dropping. So it's really not so easy to say the sea level rise. You really have to take a closer look. And last aspect, this thing which you see from the geometrical point of view includes both the additional ice, which is now in the ocean, and also the additional volume caused by temperature increase. And if you want to separate those two effects, you have to combine altimetry and grace. And then with these two geodetic techniques, you can actually separate these two very important drivers of sea level change. And this brings me to the conclusions. With the satellite, not only with satellite, but also with these satellite observations, geodesy can make an important contribution for quantifying climate change. We can contribute to ice mass balances. We can help measure the global and the regional sea level. And we can help with the understanding of the global water cycle, both on the ground and below the ground. But of course, we cannot do it alone. 
because as geodesists, we mainly provide the measurements. And then it really gets interesting when we start interpreting them together with climate scientists, with oceanographers, with glaciologists. And there are very, very close cooperations with those scientific disciplines. And this is also one um, reason why the IAG has recently established a new intercommission committee with the topic geodesy for climate research to intensify these cooperations between ge geodesists and other scientific disciplines working on climate change. That's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much to both um, Dr. Potanen and Dr. Eicher for your presentations. Uh, I think they, these were very good um, presentations in terms of showing, you know, giving both, uh, in the case of uh, the first presentation, an introduction uh, to Theo uh, uh, which in fact I, I, I do find um, as a student that it is a bit of a um, sort of not very well known um, field. Um, so I think it's it's extra important uh, to have this this session in that sense. Um, and uh, as an introduction also to the work of the International Association of Geodesy um, and uh, the the presentation about um, the, the researcher, the research of um, Dr. Riker, uh, in terms of um, how um, geodetic uh, data um, shows the 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 worrying trends um, of climate change, uh, and to um, start with um, some questions uh, to you. Um, I would um, first begin with um, the the topics that um, Dr. Potanin addressed, um, and I would possibly start uh, with uh, one thing that was mentioned, uh, which was, for example, the the um, earthquake that happened in in Japan and that had uh, very serious uh, consequences. Um, I'd first want to start by asking you um, how um, research in geodesy, um, how geodetic data uh, can help uh, in terms of prediction of these kinds of phenomena, of phenomena and um, what um, can be done in using those predictions uh, to minimize any damage that can can any fallout that happens from um, these phenomena? Yeah, that's the good question. And <laughs> because uh, at the moment we are in, in a situation that uh, uh, in many cases we can see that uh, something is happening, something will happen, but we are not uh, still at the place where we can predict when it will happen. Like in, in case of this kind of earthquakes that uh, we can see that uh, there are some deformation uh, and there is some uh, stress accumulating in some place. And we know that there will happen something sooner or later, but when it is, it is totally unknown. It, it's a good example of this uh, big Japanese earthquake. It was just a few months before that event. There was uh, published a paper where uh, it was about, I think, 10 years data collected uh, showing how the the whole island of that, that part of Japan was uh, deforming during the years when the uh, this uh, Pacific plate was colliding uh, to the Japan Japanese island, and it caused the deformation of the island, and that was very well visible on that uh, data of of this permanent GNSS network on the island, and it was uh, it was published saying that there will be sooner or later earthquake uh, in that zone where, where the subduction was happening. And it happened a few, few months, a, a year later, something like that. Uh, 
The problem was that we were seeing it, but we had no idea when it will happen. And, and also, also so that uh, what is the magnitude of the earthquake? Uh, it's also unknown because it depends on so many uh, unknown things that there would be just a magnitude of five or six or seven, or was this huge one more than magnitude nine? And of course, in, in this case, it, it was even more uh, bad thing because uh, there was this movement where the, the slab was uh, falling down uh, in, in several meters there, causing the big shock wave, which caused the tsunami. So it also depends on the mechanisms, how this happened, that uh, are they, for instance, are they creating tsunamis? Another example is uh, in uh, Chile, where there was one of these fundamental geodetic stations. And there was also the big earthquake some when it was five years ago, more than five years ago. And uh, there as well, uh, next morning, the station was some 10 meters in a different place on the earth. So it, it means that uh, uh, it can also happen that we have problem with uh, maintaining our reference frame so that uh, even our fundamental stations are suffering this, uh, this kind of things. So we can, we can measure, we can see, but still we don't, uh, we, we don't, uh, we are not able to predict that when it happens, what is the actual, uh, the magnitude and so on. So earthquake is one of these things we really need more understanding that uh, what is the mechanism. And then this is not only geodesy, but it is uh, seismology, geophysics, every different discipline who should work together to get this more information. But thank you very much for, for that answer. Um, and in, in continuing with, with this, um, does, um, uh, I want to know, because although, of course, as I mentioned, you can't, um, uh, we're not at a moment where we can predict um, the exact um, moment, uh, the exact period in time where uh, when uh, something like this could could happen, um, but in in a sort of risk analysis, um, it's um, it's of course, and as you mentioned, a, a paper uh, had sort of predicted that sometime soon something like this could could happen. Um, so there is a a risk analysis. Uh, that is um, for which the this data is definitely useful, uh, and and so uh, the, the question that I I'd like to ask you is um, how does um, uh, if and how does um, IAG um, get involved in terms of for example um, counseling to um, um, or something uh, like that. Uh, to organizations, companies, governments, uh, in terms of, of providing data uh, and the conclusions necessary um, for that uh, risk analysis to be made and to sort of pre prevent that, uh, for example, as happened here, the situation was made a lot worse from the fact that um, close to, to uh, the the earthquake was the the nuclear plant. Uh, so uh, how does um, AIG get involved in in that sense? Yeah, that is uh, something I think is very important uh, for all of us that we could somehow make these predictions. And uh, one thing what uh, what we have been doing, of course, it is. Uh, many of us and many organizations and and also on on IHC, structural level, we are participating in some of this uh, early warning, uh, creating the early warning system, like this uh, tsunami warning, that uh, it, it's very important, first of all, the data. You should have the access to the data in real time. This is uh, nowadays possible in, in many cases that uh, the data itself is uh, going out in real time. But uh, then the second question is that uh, when you have a huge amount of data, you must also be able to analyze it uh, in real time as well. Like uh, thinking about this kind of uh, earthquake happening and then the 
question is that uh, will there be the tsunami? What you can do is that you have uh, the observations of the sea level changes. And you must have that the real time analysis that now there is a tsunami creating. It's coming, you must give the prediction and warning. You may have some minutes or tens of minutes time to save people from the, uh, this disaster area. So this is one example that what we can do that we try to improve uh, the data delivery data analysis and then we have to work together with the authorities to get this warning system up and running. Uh, okay, this is this is one one typical thing and uh, these are the most uh, difficultest uh, things to think about this kind of earthquake or tsunami which uh, happen very very quickly. But then we have also the other kind of uh, things uh, which happening much more slowly like the sea level rise which can uh, indicate it, it can cause uh, equal big damages but uh, you have some more time uh, to accumulate on that but the question is that how well we can predict what is the amount of the sea level rise or if you have the this uh, west antarctic uh, ice sheet uh, uh, gliding to the ocean uh, what are the consequences? Will that happen? When it will happen? So this is the, another example of uh, equally big catastrophe, even even the global level. But you may have years or decades time to to do something for that. But can we give the good enough predictions or or understanding what is happening uh, to prevent, uh, not not prevent, but somehow to accommodate on that? So these are the two. Uh, extreme examples what uh, what we should work on that uh, very quick and, and big events locally or then more slow things happening more or less globally and and uh, it's it's a good question that uh, do we have enough uh, measurements understanding cooperation to work on this kind of things okay thank you very much um uh, and continuing um in uh, the sort of the topic of um, uh, enlightening, let's say, um, public policy, um, for example, this is um, obviously at the center of um, uh, climate change and whatever solutions that um, are necessary uh, to to tackle the issue, uh, and I. I'd like to ask Dr. Eicher um, in terms of um, so it's it's of course the the data uh, has been um, very much conclusive for um, for a while now. Um, but I, I, what I want to ask you is uh, how let's say um, optimistic or uh, pessimistic you are in terms of the translation of this data into public policy that actually uh, addresses the, the issue um, with the necessary urgency, because it is the data continuously shows uh, that it's more and more urgent to take um, more profound action. So that, that is the question, the, the difficult question. It's that a I... difficult question, yeah. Um, well, I think, as you say, the data is being perceived. I mean, there's just now, at least in German newspapers, was a big headline about the Greenland ice sheet having um, crossed uh, one of these tipping points and it's like really almost not possible to save it anymore. So I think it does get also this GRACE data, for example, they do get some attention. But I don't think international politics are already doing enough to really do anything about it. I was kind of being or getting a bit more optimistic seeing all these climate strike and protests of the, of the young people around the world over the last year. So I think this has started a movement which is like super necessary and, and this has made me a bit more optimistic that maybe people will listen 
And it has also brought some more attention also to our to our research, I think, that this climate topic is, is like really getting quite some more attention. I mean, it was now a bit drowned by the corona situation, but it has been getting more attention. So maybe this is hopeful. But the measures that are, have been taken so far apparently are not enough. So yeah, I don't know. It's like a so-and-so <laughs> feeling. Yeah. yeah, actually, actually, I, I agree that uh, maybe this current situation has uh, changed a little bit that people are noticing that uh, there can be this kind of uh, global uh, uh, things and, and uh, you can work together to somehow prevent on that. So maybe maybe this is helping also in, in this climate discussion that uh, people see that this, this kind yeah. of things can happen. I, 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 I agree too, yeah. So it, the topic may have kind of overlaid the, the climate discussion a bit because over the last month, it has been only Corona in the news. But I agree with Marco that maybe this kind of global mindset, which has come from it, how to deal with global crisis, that this might really help maybe afterwards also to tackle the climate crisis. Well, with some more effort. Yeah, and it is that way different than when we looking at these uh, big earthquakes or tsunami and whatever, they are more or less local things. And people in the other part of the world, they can read the news, but it is not personal. But now this uh, corona is uh, coming to everyone. So that's the big difference. Yeah, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, I. Um, it is, um, it does, this situation does sort of force us to think more globally yeah. um, and, and linking that to, to climate change, I think is, um, is a good uh, path forward. Um, and, and to um, address the, the, the current situation, um, I want to ask both of you, um, sort of what has been the um, adaptation to, to this time, both in terms of uh, your research uh, and in terms of uh, the work of IAG, for example. Uh, what uh, challenges have you faced? What potential um, positive aspects do you note from this? Well, I think for sure, a lot of things have become more digital over the last three, four months. I mean, conferences are being moved online. And I think none of nobody of us has, has really thought how, how much you can actually do on a video conference before. Um, so that's kind of a plus, I think. On the negative side, um, well, I miss meeting colleagues and, and really talking in person to come up with ideas during coffee breaks on conferences, for example. I think um, while I agree that it's a good idea to have some things online, you don't have to fly around the world for, for any, uh, for every um, um, issue, but it is good to meet in person at least once in a while. Plus the remote teaching has been super, um, well, it has been a lot of work and, and cost a lot of time, which I could otherwise maybe have used for research. Yeah, I, I very much agree that uh, I think it is these are the consequences on that level. Then uh, on, on the negative side, what I see, especially concerning geodesy, that uh, there are also some, uh, let's say, field work or, or working where you need to travel. Like what we have a good example, I, I was mentioning that we are getting the new radio telescope and SLR system in Metsavi Observatory. Now they are delayed because uh, uh, technicians who should uh, visit to Finland, they are not able to travel. So the, this is a good example of the negative side that uh, uh, you may not be able to, to do something. But in, in general, I, I, I very much agree that uh, now we all have been noticed that uh, it's not necessary every time to travel at the other side of the globe to meet people. You can, you can do it this way. So I, I think many of these uh, meetings, you can very easily do that. But uh, of course, uh, sometimes you also need this personal contact, which uh, 
you will miss on that. So it's it's not you you cannot take the laptop in the evening to or you can take uh, to the to the restaurant to, for the for the beer. It's it's much more better to to go with your colleagues to the beer with your laptop. So it's a social contact. I I think one of these big things you will lost. Yes, um, thank you very much for, for your answers. Um, I think your points definitely highlight both the difficulties um, and a bit of the positive potential of this whole situation. Um, one of which um, is this session, for example. Um, and uh, I, I now I, I want to, to ask you, because um, I, I think it's, it's important um, as we are, um, as we have shown a bit, um, uh, both of geodesy in, in general and um, Dr. Eicher's research um, on climate change. Uh, now I'd like to, to ask you um, both to, to give sort of a sense um, the variety, um, let's say, of, um, of contributions that are possible of, or career paths that are possible uh, in geodesy, uh, both more in the theoretical um, or experimental side and, for example, um, engineering, uh, as IAPS um, also sort of represents physics engineering students, for example. <laughs> well, I, yeah, maybe you have the, another experience in, in the viewpoint of university I have in the, uh, that way, the research institute, which may be different, but you can, you can start. I, I should start? Yeah. Well, I mean, from the maybe more theoretical direction, at least for geodesists, I mean, geodesy is an engineering topic. What, what I do with satellite data, evaluating satellite orbits and inverting for climate change signal, this is perceived to be on the theoretical side, I would say. <laughs> um, so these global, um, well, yeah, global, global data analysis, um, there's a lot of data analysis, but also big data um, is always a, a big bullet point, a big issue, because if you have 20 years of satellite data observing every second or every five seconds. And that's just a huge amount of data where you can um, use machine learning um, techniques or these, these are things that um, are coming up more and more. Then on the more engineering side, um, this whole determination of coordinates and using them for, um, well, for whatever. I mean, it's not on the global, you can also have really local co coordinates. For example, a self-navigating robot in, in a cave system. It has cameras and it measures distances and angles and it kind of makes a map um, and, and, and trying to figure out where to go. So this is also where geodesists work or self-navigating cars, for example, this autonomous driving um, topic. Um, the, the automotive industry is actually very happy to, to hire geodesists. Many of my colleagues who have started with a PhD in, in my field are now working in the, in the automotive industry. Then um, there's the civil service. So geodesists are needed to measure, um, well, if you want to build a street or a building, you need like a legal map for it. And you have to kind of, somebody has to tell you where to build your building. And um, so there are also people after finishing university who, who go this path, becoming civil servants and work for the government. Yeah, <laughs> everything kind of related to cartography is also kind of included in the geodetic um, study programs because if you well have all these coordinates you can also want to learn how to make a map of it of course nowadays this is very often digital maps like google earth google maps you know um well yeah geodesists work in these fields too 
Marco, maybe you have anything to add? Yeah, well, not 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 that uh, not much to increase uh, in, increase because uh, I think you very well described uh, the wild field. I, I can I can say that I have, by myself I have an experience during one day going from cutting trees, digging ditches, uh, soldering some device and, and the programming. So it, it goes uh, from very technical or very practical things uh, to, to, to very, very uh, specific uh, other things. So I think uh, if you are thinking about what the geodesists are doing, you can find really find uh, all these very practical things you can think that there are people who are mostly doing just uh, field work or they are constructing some some devices or then there are people who are playing with this uh, big data or or making some theory it's also you you sometimes may need a very high mathematics to to create some new theory for instance gravity or or whatever i mean that there are it, it's so wild uh, topics what you can think about and it uh, totally depends on your interest, uh, wh what you are aiming for. So you can you can find very very likely you can find your place in, in geodesy, whatever you, your your skills are, and and that's uh, that's very very interesting because the ultimate uh, example really is are these uh, instruments which you are getting a huge amount of data. Um, like uh, like these uh, altimetry satellites or or even the radio telescope where you can get more than one terabyte per day it, it means that uh, the data analysis is uh, nowadays very very important and different uh, mathematical techniques where you can dig out what you want in in your huge amount of data and uh, in the opposite side you can think about this traditional geodetic measurements in old days. We went to the field work in the beginning of the summer, came back at the end of the summer, you had one notebook uh, full of numbers, very, very few data actually. And from that uh, few numbers, you had uh, to dig out what you wanted. So also on the amount of data, you, you are on very different level and uh, that makes the things very interesting. Very well, thank you very much. Uh, now I just, um, I have, uh, I think, uh, one more question uh, and I'd like to invite anyone that is watching us um, either on Facebook or YouTube uh, or here on Zoom, uh, if you have any questions for um, our speakers, um, please um, post them now um, so that we can, um, after, uh, the answer to my final question. Um, I can submit those those questions to to the speakers. Um, so now I, I, I just like to to ask you um, in in the same way that I asked um, in our first session uh, with um, Dr. Richard um, Essary of IX. Um, how so as a IAG being um, an international um, organization, um, how so? How um, international is it? So, in the sense of uh, how has it been evolving into um, uh, you know different uh, countries, different parts of the world, um, getting more more people. Uh, involved also as um, um, uh, more higher education opportunities appear uh, in more countries. So how has the, the situation evolved? Yeah, I, I think this uh, space geodesy has changed a lot during the uh, last half of century because earlier, of course, we had uh, always, we have had uh, global geodesy in that way that uh, there are phenomena, there are things which are global, and you have to measure and understand those that uh, you are able to handle uh, the local things. But uh, before the space age, it was very, very difficult in most cases to get this kind of global things. And uh, it's, uh, it was more close to, how to say, surveying and geodesy 
on local level, you, you measured your national reference frames, you measured your national height systems and so on, and then you may have some connection to the neighboring countries. But uh, after the space age, since last 50 years or more, you have to be more and more global. So that way it, it has been getting very global at the moment. But on the, on the other hand, we have a lot of uh, regional and local things like uh, thinking about Europe. We have the European reference frame, which has been now applied in, in uh, all European countries. And that is taken by the EUREF, the, uh, the Subcommission of uh, International Association of Geodesy for Europe, for the reference frames. So both the ways we have been developed at, uh, uh, on, on global uh, for the navigation and, and this uh, climate change, all these things are global. And then we have also this uh, regional or, or local things like every country has their own geodetic system for their practical purposes. Uh, and all these are linked to the European or, or any other continent, uh, regional things and uh, further to the global. So that way, I, I think we have the whole scale. Very well. Uh, thank you very much for, for that answer. Um, I, I'm checking um, and it doesn't seem we have any further questions. Um, so now I'd like to ask you um, um, finally if you have any um, final remarks or message to leave. Uh, to the, the people watching and to the people that will watch us later. Dr. Riker can... <laughs> well, thanks for watching. And um, yeah, if, if, if any point you do, you do get questions, you can also look us up on, on the internet and, and, and contact us with questions on geodesy. And, and if you're interested to in getting involved with this field or if you could like imagine working in this field, um, I will be very happy to, to get an email from you or you can contact me on, on Twitter or, or whatever. Um, and I will be happy to answer questions also later. And thanks for, for, for watching us. And, and uh, also that uh, seeing our introductions that uh, uh, there can be very, very different backgrounds to end up to geodesy. And uh, I have a good example in, in our institute that there are people coming like me, have the background in astronomy and physics. There are people from mathematics. There are people from surveying, uh, even, even geography. So there are a lot of different uh, backgrounds. So it, it, it means that uh, like physics is a very good starting point because uh, the basic physics is the same <laughs> globally. And, and uh, if you know that, if you know mass and mathematics, uh, if you have some practical skills, whatever, I think all those are very, very good background. And it's the only question that uh, how you end up to that. And there are many universities, every country, you have the possibility to study geodesy. You have to find out how and where. But uh, uh, that is, the, I think, uh, just a sign that uh, uh, you don't need to very specific uh, things to study in the beginning. You, when, we, when you end up, then you, you will have geodesy, you have geophysics, you have mathematics, and that is, that is the way you can get. Okay. Thank you very much um, for, for that answer. Uh, and now I want, um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Annette Eicher and uh, Dr. Marco Potanen for your presence uh, in this session. Uh, I think we, we covered uh, the topic very well uh, and hopefully um, leave here a, a motivation for students to um, at least consider the, the field of geodesy uh, in its many applications. Uh, and I also want to thank everyone that is, um, that is watching us and that will be watching us later. Um, and just leave here uh, to continue following our uh, calendar of sessions. Um, today we're, we're going to have uh, another one about astronomy and culture later. Uh, so you can follow that one. 
Uh, and um, thank you again to our speakers for um, your availability. Thank you. Thank you.